Um, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest. You've seen his range and everything from legend to Eurovision. Uh, for his work in Downton Abbey, of course, he is a SAG Award winner. Please welcome Dan Stevens. so much for being here. Congratulations. Uh, you actually have a really good track record in film. I don't know if you've ever made a bad movie, and I don't know if many of you can say that. I don't know about that. That's very funny <laughs> to say. Um, thank you for coming out and seeing this. Absolutely. And this is primarily an audience of SAG after actors. So I actually like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Because knowing that um, you're not from here, I imagine you might have been a fairly established actor even before you got it. That's a really... Good question. Go on. I think it was Scott Frank's Walk Among the Tombstones. Which you just watched last night. I think that's that's what so it, crazy. I think that what, that's what got me my SAG card. So, I need to check. I don't know. so you already had a SAG award for the ensemble of Downton Abbey oh. before you got a SAG card? Is that possible? I don't that's know. That's totally possible. I need to go back and, and look. Yeah, that's, that, that is possible, I guess. Yeah, we did. I guess we did win that before, before that movie, but yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Um, so, in all the wide variety of things you've done, I, I don't think that I ever imagined you would be in a German film. <laughs> um, how did uh, Under Man sort of find its way to you? Well, I, I actually did another movie in German about 13 years ago. Um, I was in a biopic of Hildegard Knef, and her second husband was a, a, an Englishman who spoke German. Um, and so I had, I had sort of I guess my name was sort of echoing around the, the corridors of the German film industry, and, and um, they were looking for, or Maria Schreider was looking for an actor who was not German, but could get their, their head and their mouth around this very complex German that this android would have to speak. So I think they were, they were considering all nationalities, and then they heard that I could speak German, so they quickly changed the script in British, and uh, <laughs> sent off to me and, and, and to see if I liked it. Um, but it, it could, could easily have been Brazilian or, or anything, I guess, but um, I was very happy that they settled on, on British. It's such a smart, timely script. What was sort of your first impressions when you read it, and specifically about the role of poem? Yeah, I mean, there were so many things. I think it's, it's so rare to read something that feels so funny and also yet so philosophical and profound. Like, it, it, it had sort of the sweet, silly thing that I love, and also something very, very... Uh, very important to say, I think, about, about humanity and about love and all these things. And and, um, and I also saw tremendous potential for, for physical comedy. And just, it just struck me as such a funny idea to try and to try and do this. And also, speaking German at the same time, it was sort of a hat on a hat on a hat, a, a challenge. <laughs> and, and I was like, this is going to be this is going to be fun. Wait, are you wearing a robot in honor of the character? I am. I just realized that. <laughs> oh, look at that themed outfit. I love it. <laughs> So what were sort of your initial conversations with Maria like? I, she's an actor as well as a filmmaker, and she has to get both. It's kind of frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's a, a formidable German actress and, and, and was sort of, you know, incredibly highly regarded in, in Germany and has just recently turned to directing direct film with the Dr. course. And um, yeah, we had, a, we had an amazing chat, and I think she wanted, she, what she really wanted was the assurance that I would be able to deliver that dialogue at the speed that Tom would need to speak it. Um, I thought it was a test of my German, so I, we had this whole interview in German and uh, over Zoom. Um, this, it was mid-pandemic, I think it was sort of April or May of, of 2020. And uh, so I was terrified that you know she was analysing my grammar and you know was I using this adjunctive correctly and things like that. And, um, actually, she just wanted to know that I could you know that I could speak it and, uh, and, uh, and speak it fast and. and uh, yeah, so I, I showed that I could, uh, and hung up and thought, oh God, uh, I've got to go and improve my German pretty good. <laughs> um, Tom is such a fascinating character because you know he's programmed to be the perfect man for whatever that means to whoever it means. Um, it's sort of a strange question, but how do you sort of go about preparing to play a robot? And are there conversations about how robotic he should be from moment to moment because he's trying to be human? Right, I mean that's that's the key, I think, and and it was definitely a, a, something that I sort of graded with with Maria was kind of you know over the course of it how how much of the robot, how much of the human we wanted to see, and we wanted to see an evolution, and that's really the key that he's a he's an android who wants to become more human, um, so he's not in a fixed state, and so we wanted a sort of a starting point, and we. We like the idea that he'd been pre-programmed with, you know, the twenty greatest chatbots of all time, and, and and also that he had this 
I don't, I don't know whether it was a coincidence that Marin Eggett has a certain kind of Catherine Hepburn quality to her, but we like the idea that he also had this sort of screwball comedy back catalogue uh, going on. And so we looked specifically at a lot of Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart movies and, and, and just sort of borrowed certain mannerisms from certain scenes of Philadelphia story and just thought, wouldn't it be funny if Tom just did that movement in this scene for no reason, but just that he had it in his, in his sort of memory bank, that this is how humans behave. Um, we borrowed Cary Grant's hair color, for example, um, for Tom. And uh, and so in terms of the look, I very much then gave myself over to, to Maria and, and the costume designer and makeup designer and just sort of said, well, what do you think this guy should look like? You know, I didn't want to come with my uh, preconceived notion of, of my perfect man. I wanted it to be them, their you know, uh, ideal creation. So there was, a, there was an interesting collaboration there. But um, insofar as the, the, the physical preparation, um, it was really about just borrowing borrowing human characteristics and kind of breaking them down and, and distorting them and putting them in odd places and odd times and things like that. In her direction, would she ever tell you you were being too human or, or too robotic for the character? I sp um, She's probably a better director than me. She has, <laughs> she has better words, but... I think, I mean, we, we knew going into each scene, you know, we, we had a couple of weeks, I guess, before we started shooting, where we, we just went through every scene and just looked at, at you know, exactly where we were in the story and... It was very much graded on Alma as well. Like he's a, he's a creature who is he's designed to cater to her and to respond to her to to behave in the in the way that he sees best fits her in that given situation. So according to her mood and, and what she wanted and desired in that scene, you know, Tom was sort of calibrated accordingly. So it became very much a dance in in that direction. It wasn't the conventional actor scene partner kind of relationship, and I think Marin found that quite tricky at first. I found it kind of tricky at first because I wasn't allowed to respond in the way that I would normally respond. And there were certain scenes where Maria was like, look, you just have the courage to do nothing yet. Um, which is an actor, you know, you always want to feel like you're doing something or like acting. And actually, you know, with, with Tom, it was sort of just let him be, let her emote and actually read so much, I think, into a, into a blank canvas sometimes. And um, that, was a, that was a great revelation to me. Uh, I actually want to talk about your co-star, Mary. Is it Eggert? Yes. I'm always yeah. afraid I'm going to mispronounce people's names. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, the two of you have such fantastic chemistry, and I know that that can be hard to define. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have time to get to know the person. Um, considering you shot this in the pandemic, did you have any time to rehearse or get to know each other, or did you just find that you kind of hit it off naturally? We did. Um, we, we had a little time uh, together, and it was you know it was shot under very strict protocols. And in fact, this was one of the first films that Berlin allowed to be shot under under COVID. And so you know we were all incredibly lucky, and it was a it was a very kind of safe bubble. Um, and uh, and we did have a little time to to get to know each other, you know, sort of pre production. But um, yeah, as I say, it was it was an interesting dance in kind of learning what their specific rhythm was going to be. Um, and I think once we found that, we were off for the races, but there was there were definitely a few days when we thought, this is kind of weird, this doesn't feel, it didn't feel like a normal, the normal flow of the scene. Um, but I think that's what gives it its sort of unique flavor, I guess. Uh, was there any kind of chemistry meet, even over Zoom, or did you just meet on the set? No, Marin had been cast, and uh, Maria knew her work from, from German theatre, and she's done a lot of work, uh, actually she works a lot in French, and so we had we sort of bonded over that, that she works in her second language quite a lot, and now I was working in mine, and um, so she had already been cast, and, and Maria was really looking for the most human actress she could find. She kept saying this, you know, it's like, she's such a mensch, and uh, uh, she really, it is such a beautifully nuanced you know, human performance, and um, and then she, you know, got to looking for this foreign actor who could give a very sort of odd, inhuman performance. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the highest compliment when I say it's inhuman. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of a strange question, but I always, I sometimes have concern for actors when they play, you know, roles that are kind of stern and drown and, and you know, uh, torturous parts. And I was watching Tom, and he seems like so joyous in so many ways. Did you find like playing him actually what like you know was nice that you liked you liked stepping into this guy's I was gonna say skin but he's a robot. Yeah, I, I liked it very much. I mean, even from the beginning where he's he's a bit of an idiot really and gets it wrong, um, but he thinks he's getting it so right. I think that's what's so kind of funny. And this this 
I think there's something lovely about the sort of the naive, it's almost a genre in itself, the kind of, whether it's the, the reanimated caveman who's brought back to life or Wonder Woman who's sort of dropped into our world or whatever, it's like, you know, you bring that outsider into the modern world, it's like, how do they find their feet? And, and so there is this sort of childlike element, you know, despite the fact that he has all of human knowledge stored there somewhere, he's still kind of finding his way in terms of, of looking at human nature and understanding what it is that makes us human rather than, you know, the answer to some crazy math problem. What do you think has been the hardest character to shed, or the one that maybe you, you know, challenged you the most, just in terms of living in that skin? Of, of the roles that I play? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, I mean, my mind immediately goes to the guest, but then again, he's, he's a psychotic, so maybe he's perfectly fine. <laughs> he's pretty, pretty focused, pretty yeah. single focused. Um, <laughs> He has no problem yeah, going um, to sleep at night. Yeah, God, that's a really good question. I mean, Legion was pretty all immersive, yes. and, and you know, obviously the, the amount of time it took to shoot a season of that, and, and for such a kind of uh, disturbed character, and, and such a kind of a, a series that kept you so on your toes as a performer, you know, every single day on set was so different and so challenging for all departments. Um, yeah, I may, maybe that one. That's a tough one, because that's also many episodes, you probably shot for like a year, I would say? It's about five months a year. Um, yeah, that's amazing. I was also thinking, looking over the roles you played. Speaking of Legion and you know Beauty and the Beast and just just everything, you did a really good job of avoiding typecasting in your career. <laughs> is, is that something? Do you sort of like look to not repeat yourself, or have you just kind of been lucky in what you're drawn to? I mean, I think typecasting comes from just saying yes to the same thing over and over again. <laughs> so you know, it's having the courage to say no to something similar sometimes. And, and but variety is really what what fires me up, and, and I think. If, I ha if there's something I haven't done before or something I never thought I would get a chance to do, um, like The Guest is a great example, you know, they, they don't make movies like that in England and, and uh, you know, it was something that involved me having to move to the States to, to be given that opportunity, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something outside of my comfort zone that excites me, um, that, you know, I guess causes me to find that, that sort of you know, varied part. Did they come to you for The Guest or did you have to convince them at all? Uh, I guess it was a bit of both, really. really? Um, yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think now. I was certainly sent the script and thought it was amazing and hilarious and, and, and sort of demanded to meet with, with Adam and we just, we hit it off right away. That's so interesting to me. I just, you know, I, I assume people were pursuing you madly for, for every role. I don't think anybody thought the guy from Downton Abbey would be the fit for that, for that role. <laughs> so, yeah, there was definitely some, some persuasion somewhere. Um, we talked about Maria as both a performer and a director, and I'm sure her work as an actor has informed her as a director. Um, I'm sort of curious what you like from a director. You know, when you show up to set, what you sort of hope for. I think it's a, anybody who can create at the, at the core of a set, and sometimes, you know, like this film, you know, we had this script protocols, very reduced crew. I guess there were 20 or 30 people kind of around the main, the main unit. Um, sometimes there are hundreds, it seems, you know, on a big studio picture, and, and any director who can create at the core of their set a, a playful and kind of safe environment in which you can fail, um, you know, because you need, you'd be courage to know that they're not going to use the bad bits, and, <laughs> and that if you have that environment, you have that space, um, whether it's comedy or, or, you know, serious drama, I think you know, to have, to have that little sandbox that you can just really throw everything at it, um, that's really valuable, I think. Not every director can create that, um, but I've been lucky to work with a few who can, and it's, it's incredibly special. So you're making a film uh, in German, which is not your first language. How many languages do you speak? I speak a little French. Just a little yeah, French, a okay. You're probably fluent, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're making a film in another language. It's during COVID. Um, pretty, you know, independent budgets. Um, also, very challenging character. What ended up being the most challenging part of making a movie for you? If there was a specific scene or moment, or you know, just you talked about finding the tone. I'm sure that can be hard. Uh, I would say learning the rumba. <laughs> uh, that's a really hard dance. I was like, I'm going to be a very dance the rumba, but it's it's the precision. If you want to get it right, this is. Um, and I was we shot that sequence for various reasons, mainly COVID-related, all of the crown stuff was shot towards the end of the shoot so we could, you know, get the bulk of, of our sort of two-handers out of the way before anybody exposed themselves to large groups. Um, and so the whole way through the shoot, 
any day that I wasn't working, I was in the, the dance studio with this incredibly strict German <laughs> teacher who was like a world champion ballroom dancer. And actually, his physicality and the kind of physicality required to kind of perfect the rumba really, I think, helped him inform Tom. But it's a, it's a tough it's a tough balance to perfect. And uh, and then when we sort of transferred it from a, an empty dance studio to a, a you know, that little ballroom full of people. Um, it was it was challenging, but it was a lot of fun as well. How many times do you think you shot that scene? How many takes did yeah. I do of that? I don't know, okay. four or five probably. Okay, yeah. not too bad. Yeah. Okay. Did you retain any, any of your rumba skills? <laughs> probably somewhere. Muscle memory, probably. I do want to take a couple questions from the audience. Um, if you have one, just raise your hand. And uh, sorry, there's a bright light in my eyes, so it's hard for me to see. Um, you're all being so light. Right there. Did you happen to watch the John Malkovich movie, Making Mr. Right? Oh, Making Mr. Right. right. That's a great question. I have seen that movie. I didn't watch it specifically for this. Um, and actually, I didn't, you know, I didn't watch a huge amount of sort of android <laughs> performances. I mean, I have, I have seen them. I guess culturally, I've absorbed them, uh, it, you know. Um, and you know, I'm always going to be indebted to see 3 po um, But, uh, <laughs> but uh, specifically for this, I, I wasn't I wasn't really looking at, at sort of emulating Android, other Androids. Um, I was looking more at sort of deconstructing the human, I suppose. I remember when I found out there was a man in the C-3PO suits, and it was, it was really traumatizing for me. I actually really didn't like knowing that. Um, sure, right down here. Yes. Um, was there any tricks? To keep your eyes so intense and wide open. Oh, yeah, <laughs> your eyes intense and wide open. That's, that's a good question. I don't I know. Never saw you I mean, I, with an Android, play, I suppose an Android does play. Um, I, I, I don't know if I have any tricks. I, it may be so. Did it require any special contact lenses? No, no. Um, it's just a party trick of mine, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always keep you in a staring competition. Uh, <laughs> was it a conscious decision, though, to, to not blink? Like, I know. You know, famously in Silence of the Lambs, he never blinks. Right. Yeah, I think it, I think it was. I mean, I think when you see, I mean, I, I'm now I always have been obsessed with the, sort of the development of, of androids and, and robots, and it, it you know by the minute I, I feel like the you know the, the articles about you know this robot that's been developed and um, I've been following the developments. I don't know if anyone's read about this I, Ida, this uh, creative robot in, yes. in England that's writing her own poetry and painting portraits, really? and the the facial tics that are sort of programmed into these robots are really interesting. So they do blink and they raise an eyebrow and they sort of wrinkle their brow and it's like, so need to do that. But I guess, is it for us that they're sort of programmed to do that, that it feels more relatable? I don't know. Um, so it was it was sort of choosing insofar as was possible, you know, with my human face, um, you know, which characteristics to, to let come through, I suppose. Do you have a room a Roomba? A Roomba. I think that's a Roomba. Um, we, we do, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I'm on pretty good terms with it. Yeah. Oh, so mine <laughs> hates me. Yeah. It's always like attacking my foot. <laughs> <laughs> my dog. My dog hates me. Yeah, but it's more attacking the dog. I think we're time for one more. So I'm sure, right over there. So I had a question. Um, when you were trying to be the perfect man for her, what was, what was the emotion that you were trying to capture so that it would be relatable to us? But in still, playing, sorry, yeah, in playing the character. In playing play. the perfect man, what were the emotions you were trying to capture for the audience? The audience, so that it would also look like you were actually connecting with her. Mm. That's really interesting because he's not—he's not really experiencing emotion. His main drive is to is to please and to want to calibrate himself so that he can serve her best in that given situation, and so. For example, when the boyfriend, the, the ex-boyfriend comes to pick up the painting and, and he kind of read, has to read the situation to think, okay, well, what's, what's the best thing I can play here? What's the best scenario I can create here to alleviate the situation for her? Um, and so you can kind of see, and you can kind of feel him feeling like he's done, you know, job well done kind of thing, but it's not, it's, it's an odd one to describe. It, it, it's like mission accomplished is, is is the emotion, I suppose, but it's not really an emotion. It's like okay, I've ticked this, I've ticked that box in terms of you know smoothing the situation over for her, and she kind of recognizes that, and so there's like a bond that develops between them because she's like, oh, actually, he's kind of useful in this situation. But, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if he's like 
emotionally thinking and mm. thing, if you if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's yeah. more it's more it was always sort of calibrated according to Alma and, and what how she was behaving, I guess. You don't think he's a little proud? Little proud of himself, maybe? Maybe a little. Maybe. I mean, if robots can be proud. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, no, it's such a wonderful question, though, because it, it, it's true. It's like you read, you want to read emotion into him because that's our, that's oh. our instinct. He looks like a man and, and he's talking, walking like a man, but he's, he's yeah. It's, it's one of the great tricks of the film, I guess. Well, it's such a special movie. I want to remind everyone, please spread the word. Let everyone know that they can watch this now in their own homes. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.